Sisonke, well done. Thank well you. Done. I'm like the most excited <laughs> person who ever wrote a book. <laughs> So, you know, as I was coming down here and driving um, and listening to the news, and I'm thinking that your next book should be entitled um, Always Another Cabinet. <laughs> 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 but, uh, and we'll be talking about that uh, when <laughs> once you write it, but I think it, it's an apt uh, title to your next book. Um, <laughs> It is a beautiful story, Sisonke. There's gender, there's class, there's race, but it's also a human story. Um, you know, it made me laugh so much, and it also made me cry so much. And I think that's what a good book does. You cry and you laugh, and you've done that, and, and congratulations. Thank you. Um, before we get into the story, um, you know, it, it's <laughs> I'm interested in the style of that you, you, you decided on. You decided to go for um, a creative uh, nonfiction. And as I was reading it, I mean, the, you know, the characters are so rich. Um, the plot is so, you know, you, you develop your plot. Um, there's tension that builds up. Um, did you want to write a novel or did you want to write? So there were two drafts of this book. One was the first draft, which was um, a memoir. And then I started getting scared. And I was like, hey, let me hide people, you know, let me disguise people. So then I developed it into short stories and I changed everybody's name but I kept everything exactly the same like everything that had happened in real life happened and then I just changed it and changed the names and then I was like why um, and I wondered about what it would mean to fictionalize my whole life when there was so much richness in real life and so then I went back so there were it was a very long process of writing this book but so, so yes, you're right. I wanted to write it in a way that allowed people to connect with it. And I n know that nonfiction is often written in a very tr crisp and dry way, and I didn't want to do that. So. Yeah, and you succeeded. It's really, really <laughs> beautiful. Um, but so let's go into the story itself. Um, you say, you know, it starts in Zambia. No, it doesn't really start in Zambia. It actually starts in 1962, right? Or 1960s? When, he l when my father leaves South Africa, yes. Yeah, and, yep. then, um, and then, you, you know, it's a story of an exiled child. And I'm just wondering if you want to sort of describe what is an exiled child. So I think there isn't a definitive thing called an exiled child. And one of the things I've been very anxious about is this narrative of, like, one thing. So, so I think to get it out of the way quickly, it's like we were certainly the posh end of the exile town. <laughs> and there are many stories of um, kids who grew up in exile in a very different environment. There were kids in Mazimbu, there were kids in camps. Um, there's Kwezi story, uh, which were very different uh, experiences to my exile experience. And so when our parents crossed the borders of South Africa, they carried class with them. So you know, the, the Chris Hanis of the world, the, the Mavusom Simangs, they come from African middle class families, which didn't m mean anything necessarily financially. A, a black middle class family in an African context in South Africa wasn't a wealthy family. It was a family that had a particular tradition of, of being Christians, of accessing education, uh, you know, all those markers of class. And the ANC uh, has always been a very classist organization. And so, you know, my father recounts these stories of being given choices. You know, the, the Fort Hare people were going to be educated, and then the others <laughs> were going to, to do military ahead. training. Right. So, so, so f I think just to be very clear that it's the class, that the more I wrote about our lives, the more aware I was that I could not pretend that it wasn't a function of many social factors that made me even able to write the story. And so, yes, it's the story of a particular kid, which is not a universal story of exile. It's a one particular story, which is enabled by my class status. Right. But there is a universal experience, which you beautifully described here. And I'm wondering if you would just want to read it a little bit for me. Oh, wow. It's okay. page two. <laughs> 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 I was never ready. OK. Page two, mm -hmm. the third paragraph. So together, mommy and Baba? 
Okay, okay. This, I'm totally reading this cold. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, together, Mommy and Baba travel the world. My sisters and I are born in the 1970s, when my parents live in Zambia, where the African National Congress has its headquarters. From there, we move to Kenya, and then to Canada, then back to Kenya, and after that, there's a brief stint in Ethiopia. Eventually, after Nelson Mandela is released from prison in 1990, we come home. <laughs> my sisters and I are freedom's children, born into the ANC, and nurtured within a revolutionary community whose sole purpose is to fight apartheid. We are raised on a diet of communist propaganda and schooled in radical Africanist discourse in the shadows of our father's hope and our mother's practicality. On the playground, we cradle imaginary AK-47s in our skinny arms, and instead of cops and robbers, we play capitalists and cadres. <laughs> when we skip rope, we call out the names of our heroes to a staccato beat punctuated by our, uh, by our jumps. Goven Becky, hop. Skip. Walter Sisulu, hop. Skip. One, jump. Day, jump. We, jump. Will, jump. All, jump. Be, jump. Free! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just sounds like a really happy, happy childhood, <laughs> you know? Because it was games. Freedom was games, you know? Right. It wasn't, it was, of course it was real, but it wasn't. It was, we were very lucky. The, the ANC community in exile in Lusaka was, in many ways, very ideal, uh, idyllic. Idealist. Even as we know that there were things happening under the surface that weren't so great. Okay, staying with Zambia, you know, I was fascinated uh, by a few things, in particular the interaction between exiles um, and the people of Zambia, but also your descriptions of the exiled men and women uh, who came into your house. Very, very, very vivid descriptions. But one character that stands out for me is Mama Chawana. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you want to talk a little bit about her. Yeah. So it's interesting because um, one of the things about us as South Africans is we are correctly, I think, those of us who believe ourselves to be progressive are often correctly very self-critical. And when the xenophobic violence, the first incarnation, before th people were being killed, but the first incarnations of it started. I remember having all these discussions about, like, why are South Africans like this? You know, why are we doing this? So on. And having all these conversations with um, my parents about what it was like to be a refugee in, you know, growing up. And I remembered so vividly the sense of both being an insider and completely accepted and just being a kid, and also this notion of, like, mm, the refugees, you know, because that word was a stigma. So I think there is, so part of the thing is that there is a universality to being an outsider. And I wanted to both reflect on how amazing the Zambian state was towards us, and also how there was this thing about hmm, those people who come from South Africa, the men come, they want to take our women, you know, that <laughs> was certainly a factor. And it, it's important not to lie about it even as we certainly don't want to begin to defend things about xenophobia, right? But it's to put it in context. Um, so Mama Tawona was this um, gossipy woman who all of us know, wherever she is in the world, <laughs> she's universal. But she was also, you know, there are these guardians, these guardians of the patriarchy, and they can be women or they can be men. And part of what they exist to do is to put you in your place to remind you of your place. And what is happening with Mama Toana is obviously she's both um, reflecting a resentment of these people who come and take our things and are being paid for by the Zambian government, like all of that stuff on the one hand, but also like she just didn't like my mom. Yeah. You know, she was this swazi, pretty little thing who was uppity. And and who worked, <laughs> and who too, you know, who played tennis, you know, like my mom, <laughs> <laughs> mommy, and Anzanel and Becky, paid, you know, played tennis together on the weekends. You know, she wasn't like a fa fancy person at the time, but you know, so I think that Mama Tawana, it, this irked her, this riled her, and that this idea of putting a, that you often attack women through their children, and that the best way to do that is to 
remind this little girl that you, you think you, your mom thinks she's so great. She only has girls. What kind of woman is this? <laughs> Just watch. That man will leave. As soon as there's another person who can give her a son, she'll be go he'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you, you spend a little bit of time just describing this these women and men uh, who are coming into 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 your house, and these are exile. These are you know men who are living who have left South Africa coming to exile. Um, you know they're heroes. You see them as heroes, but they're also broken people in many ways. And I'm just wondering if you want to just reflect a little bit on that. So one of the things that I remember very vividly about growing up was that it was a very... Children were very important to the ANC in exile. We were, we were important as individuals, but we were also important like, as the idea of us, that we were born free, that we were loved, we were beloved, and we were this best foot forward for what Africa was going to be. You know, so we were symbolically very important. And I also remember a lot of drunkenness. A lot of people drunk a lot. That is like a very strong memory for me of childhood. Um, because people had seen things and done things and people were lonely um, and families were not together. Um, and so there was a, a kind of sense so I, I, I grew up with a very much this sense of like broken geniuses. Yes. You know, like anything was possible in post-independence Africa. Like we could do anything and yet we could also completely fall apart at any given moment. So it's, it's like yeah. a story of South Africa really, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I think you 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 are living quite a very um, protected life in in Zambia, um, but yet you know you you're not far away from from hurt and violence. Oh, sorry, am I doing anything wrong? No, okay. You also like you know not far away from 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 hurt and violence, and I'm saying this because you know you you protected because you've got um, a family that protects you. You've got, and there's this relationship between the African elite or middle class and people that work for them. And it's a very complex relationship. And, and you find out, um, sadly, that actually this is quite complex. And I just wonder you want to talk about that. Yeah, so I had to think a lot about including the issue of sexual violence in this particular way in this book and sort of recounting this experience of this trusted servant, you know, who then violates this trust. And part of what I wanted to reflect on as I talked about that experience of being seven and being violated was the ways in which um, the ANC community that we grew up in was uh, itself a very protected space. So we had the protection of the Zambian state. Kenneth Kaunda was uh, our patron. Um, my mother was a hawk, you know, she was protecting us from many things and very vigilant. Um, and the thing about violence against women and girls is that it is because of the culture around silence and shame and because you can never fully watch your kids at every given moment, even in the most protected spaces, it is possible to be violated. And so I think there's a way in which we talk about sexual violence in South Africa these days as though it happens to those kind of people, as though negligent mothers allow their children to be left unguarded, as though poor communities allow children to be ravaged. And I, I wanted to say, look at this elite African child who is most beloved and look what happens to her and look how she has this shame that will not let her speak when everybody in her life would have been mortified and would have jumped to defend her and still like I couldn't talk about it that I felt that I had done something wrong. Sisanke, was it the first time you 
talked about it in the book. It was, and then I had to now start telling them before the book came out. This is what, it's very different to talk about something publicly because I don't, the stakes are different with you guys than they are with people you have loved who you then think, oh, they're going to think that I blame them and I never, ever did, right? So then we had to have s conversations which were actually quite wonderful and beautiful in their own way. And it's funny because the process of publishing a book uh, makes people reflect on the same experience of stories in a lots of different ways. So there were, it was not an, not an easy set of conversations, but then there were also like all of these moments of like, That's why that happened. You know, there's been the story in our family for many, many years about the day that I cried and cried and wouldn't let, praise God, take me to school. Oh, that's why. And that story has been shared lots of times. She just decided. One day this child decided. And like over time, I have understood that story. At first, that story used to really bother me. And I used to like feel, as the kids say, triggered by that story, and over time I began to understand that story as a story of resilience, of like, wow, what a brave kid you were, that you just refused for that to happen. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Okay, all right. So you leave Zambia after this sort of frightening <laughs> experience for Kenya. Yep. Um, because the family once again moves to another country, right? <laughs> <laughs> Always another country. Always another country. But Kenya was not <laughs> that eventful at all. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll also. Just skip it. We'll go <coughs> to Canada. Let's just go Let's to go Canada. Let's go to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a boring part of the book. You can skip those chapters. <laughs> so you land in Canada. Your, your parents are immigrants, you know, and, and being an immigrant in North America from Africa is quite tough, right? So they're looking for work. Um, you and your sisters, you know, you go to school finally, and um, and life is gets life is easy in North America, really. It is easy, right? But also, you experience what you know what we term whiteness. Mm. It's not crude racism; it's sort of soft racism. Except it does get crude when they call you a monkey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How was that like? So, I mean, Canada was interesting because. Because we grew up thinking that we were so special, you could not you could not tell us that we were not special. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, of course I'm the best. Of course I'm the smartest. Of course I'm the beautifulest. <laughs> you know, like everyone was always, oh, you girls. You know, you are the center of life. And then you go to Canada, and suddenly you're alone. Like quite literally, there was no community. We grew up in community. Even in Kenya, it was kind of boring, but it was there were lots of South Africans there. And then, like, and then of course, there's lots of Africans. And you don't think about the fact that you're surrounded by Africans until you're not. Because you just are. You know <laughs> what I mean? Well, there's the majority. So you don't think about yourself as a majority. You're just the norm. And then suddenly, you're like in this place, and it's cold. Snow and cold. And then people are like smiling this funny smile, and you don't know what. <laughs> Is it this real smile? It's this weird. <laughs> They're very curious about you. <laughs> 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 so Canada, so you're right. Wh I mean, it's over, this a word of whiteness is overused, you know, by all of us these days. Yeah. But like, Canada was the definition of whiteness. The snow was white. In, like, the people were white. <laughs> Everything was white. <laughs> about that trip with your mom going camping, a camping oh. trip that never happened. Yeah. So we... So it's <laughs> four. Four African girls, basically, going camping. That's right. They've never camped before in never. Canada. <laughs> Mommy decides that we're going to go camping. So Baba was gone all the time. All the time. All the time. He was always gone for long periods of time. We then... Anyway. There are lots of post-book publishing revelations about what people were doing when they were traveling, including ANC missions that we didn't know about. Oh, didn't you know? <laughs> 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 anyway, so he was always gone. And so one day, and mommy was always working. 
because she, we needed to be supported. So she was always working. And in my mind, like the 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 good Canadian mother was baking cookies and <laughs> you know was home for the kids and all that stuff, right? And so she was always working. And so one day, after school, she's there. She picks us up from school. And like, we're so happy, because you know, she's there. And she's got the car, and she says, let's go camping, girls. <laughs> Come on, girls, let's go camping. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, sure. <laughs> it was just fun. It was the funnest thing that it was completely spontaneous. And when you are an African immigrant in those environments, there's very little room for spontaneity because you're saving money, because you're trying to do things the right way. You just don't have time for a certain kind of breathing. And so off we go to like Gatineau <laughs> National Park. And we drive and we get there. And now there's this tent and it's got canvas and tarpaulin <laughs> and like bits, things you must put in, hammer in. There's no hammer. <laughs> crazy it was completely insane we had no idea what we were doing so we're like struggling and thing and then it starts to rain thank god <laughs> big downpour big downpour and mommy's like girls this is not gonna work <laughs> is it <laughs> and we're like no so come on let's go home <laughs> so we never camped but, but there is a reason why she i mean she I mean, you, you know, you find out later when you come to South Africa why she decided on that day that she's going to take you guys. She had walked out of her job because her boss was an had, there was an incredibly racist incident in which she had to, he, he called her an African bitch. <laughs> and it had never happened before. And she was not going to stand for that in her own quiet. And the stakes were high because she needed the job. And she left. And of course, she wouldn't tell us that. And so she shows up because she has she's not at work because she's left and she picks up her girls they and she camping. takes them camping <laughs> so yeah anyway so um you leave canada again and you go to another country again back to kenya back to kenya um what stands out for me um uh, when on your on your trip back to kenya is that you know you this 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 interaction between the African elite, and I'm saying the African elite because that's what we're talking about, um, and how they treat the poorest of the poor. Yeah. And you know, I was reminded of that when I saw Mbalula, Fikile Mbalula's um, Photoshop, photo op, um, with, with the, with, with the yeah. guys, yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that incident with the, uh, with the kid who stole your bike? Yeah, so I mean, for me, Leaving Canada marks this moment where we stop being like, where we stop hustling, and where there is this jump to this n another level of privilege and access to many things, um, a really amazing education which is paid for by the company that my you know, father is working for, which is the company exists to solve poverty, <laughs> so the irony of <laughs> like the <this> aid industry <laughs> <laughs> sending their children to these international schools. So you know, good, good for us that we were able to access those opportunities, but, that, that it, but it's important to be able to think about what that means. And so Kenya marks this very different phase. And then Kenya is a country that has a very different history from Zambia, has a very different history from Tanzania, um, Mozambique, all these countries where the liberation struggle was strong and old and and also embedded very much within the soul of people kenya was not that and i think if you look at kenya even today mm. and the kind of ethnic uh, divisions and the extreme elitism that you see in kenya it's that was what i was experiencing not always knowingly but we were part of this class and it's hard to not see it so so when my bike was stolen, this bike that I had saved up for, my mo one of the things about my mother was she was incredibly invested always in us being independent girls. And that meant saving money. 
Mommy was like an advocate. You save money. You plan your life. You save your money. You take your pocket money, and you have a plan for what you want to do with your money. So I had saved my money to get this bike. The bike was very important to me. The bike was something I had saved for, but the bike was also like a symbol of Canada. So here I am like this <laughs> coconut kid <laughs> riding this bike with these skinny wheels over the bumpy potholes of Nairobi. The bike is not going to work. It's, not, it's, just a, it's a fantasy, right? <laughs> but I'm projecting like this identity that I've just managed to grab onto. I'm finally this Canadian kid, and now you guys are making us move again. To Africa. To Africa, <laughs> this bumpy, <laughs> dusty place that I don't want to like. And of course, it, it is immediately comfortable because I grew up in Africa. But also, like, I want to be this Canadian kid. So I'm riding this bike around. And of course, like, I'm this prime target. And I'm like this shiny, you know, brownie, brownie, you know, <laughs> nice, <laughs> you know, plumpy, plumpy thing <laughs> on this bike. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Target. <laughs> and this, like, little kid comes. It was, like, just very shocking. And he steals my bike out from under me, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> Like, who are you that you can actually be sitting on the bike when it is stolen from you? <laughs> <laughs> and so there it goes. And like, and I think for South Africa, this resonates very much in this country where like people take your shit. Yeah. And you're mad because you work for the shit. But actually, there's a system that makes them need the shit yeah. more than you do. So it was a very early encounter with my own privilege, and with this bigger sense of justice versus injustice. And I was on the wrong side of history on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Nelson Mandela is released and you come home. You, you, you go visit your grandfather for the first time. Yeah. And then you, get a, you hear a story about how your dad left. It's quite touching yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Because the thing about when, you're, when you grow up in exile, you only know the exile side, and you don't. And so you imagine the who everyone at home, and you imagine what it must be like. But you, you don't hear the what it felt like to be left. You only understand what it felt like to leave. So, like here's this, and, th and then the thing about coming home was like all oh, these mzalas and they look like you? <laughs> and you're like, this is weird, because we've never met. Yeah. But the genetics, like that thing is deep, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go to Peter Maritzburg, and we meet my grandfather, and, he, and, and, he, and my father looks like him, and he tells the story uh, of like all those years when the policeman would come and like ask him questions. Where's your son? And he's like, dude, I don't know. Because literally the guy did not know. The, 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 they did not tell him. He didn't tell him. He had no idea. And then he does that. For me, the thing was this moment where he says, he comes in and he has this photograph and it's my dad. And it's like 10 years after he's left. And it's the first sign he has that this guy is still alive. And so he's full of joy. Like he's alive, but he can't he show him. That villain, yeah, that's my son. Because <laughs> he's giving something away and he yeah. doesn't know how much he's giving versus what, you know. So it was really like, it was like, you know, really that hit me very hard listening to the story that when Kulu told it. But they also, I mean, the policeman and your grandfather they actually they developed, they became, they become mates. <laughs> they become mates <laughs> over these 10 years. It's yeah, weird, yeah. Because, it, because the thing about apartheid was like there was this prescribed hatred. And then there was the familiarity of having to come to see everyone every two weeks. Like, you know, <laughs> there you are. Hey. <laughs> so, have you seen the guy? <laughs> you know, and the policeman knows, like, he hasn't seen the guy. And, <laughs> and Kulu knows that he hasn't seen the guy. And, and then he comes back again next week. And then he's going to come back again and ask the same question. You know, so it was like this, this game. And yet prescribed. And so they both had a duty to do. But then there's also, like, humanity. Um, and so he was like, yeah. So, yeah, it was a very... Did your father ever see the policeman? No, no, I never even knew his name, uh, you know? Yeah. Never even knew his name. Okay, so um, Sisonke comes and visits for a bit and goes back and goes finishes school in, in the States and goes to college. Yep. There's two things I want to talk about in mm -hmm. your college time. Um, it's just being black and immigrant in America. 
and the other is your first love, but I won't. Everybody's like, oh, Jason. <laughs> You're Jason. <Yeah. laughs> but let's we're talk back to Jason now. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about being black. Yeah, let's let's talk, we don't need to talk about Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I was pretty insufferable in college. I was a very hardcore. I was not an easy. Um, I was not an easy black. <laughs> but I mean, what you say is that you discovered that being black in America um, made you realize your blackness. Mm. Uh, or America made you realize your blackness in many ways. Your friends yep. were outed because they were black and they would tell stories about being freaks all the time, um, not being recognized, that America doesn't recognize you. Yeah. I all. mean, so, you know, it's one Canada was one thing, but I was a child. And so uh, what was interesting about Canada was you're like, you're like, oh, I'm not like these people. So. That's the encounter with whiteness and with the demographic reality of being a minority, right? Um, but we left quickly. And then there's the political consciousness of being you know, 18 years old and discovering the world and being on your own and not having the filter of your parents who are explaining the world to you. And then to realize that this place is brutal and that the thing about living in America was also that they didn't know what I was. I'm, you know, I'm legible in many different places as just a black person, right? So my accent can, can it's, it's neutral, yeah? So, and then you see the person standing at the bus stop and they're just a black person, right? And so it was a place where suddenly I was implicated. In Kenya, you're protected by your class privilege. And then in America, that class privilege thing Definitely. has some protections, but actually, because of the brutality of it and the deliberate misrecognition, because America uh, ref refuses to accept black people as proper citizens because of the slavery thing, like they were never supposed to be staying there as human beings. They were supposed to be chattel and, you know, like that thing is real and it stays. It's part of the DNA of the country. And so your experience as a black person is fundamentally shaped by that history. So it was very confronting, very powerful, and I, it was the time when I had to make a choice in terms of what solidarity means. Other black South Africans, other South Africans had to make those choices by virtue of being in South Africa, right? White people who decided to have solidarity with black people and be part of the freedom struggle you were making those choices. In America, I had to make the choice to be a black person who recognized that in America, it meant a certain thing to be black. So it was very, America is very important to me in terms of my own personal politics. Yeah. Okay, and you, 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 you made your first love there. And then I made Jason. my first love. Jason was trouble, 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 oh. trouble. Like I read, I'm like, Sisonke, no, don't do it. <laughs> He was so good looking. <laughs> <laughs> so troubled. Everybody knew he was trouble. I if I knew he was trouble. <sighs> but he was if it, there was yeah. He was yeah. What would you tell your your little girl now, uh, looking back? I don't think anyone could have told me anything. Because everybody told me. You know, like everybody told me, and he told me about himself. Yeah. <laughs> Trouble always announces itself okay, at your door. I'm going <laughs> to find Jason. Trouble tells you it's coming. It knocks very loudly. And I knew he was trouble, but I needed it. You needed I just want to find that, that <laughs> part where Don't Jason explains himself. Don't make me read it. I want you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's at the end of the chapter, and he says, I'm the... I'm not going to finish the sentence. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm the real I'm the real Which page was it? And it's the last... Um, <laughs> sorry. Our color-coded thing, it doesn't <laughs> work anymore. Uh, Lisa, Jason's last Jason chapter. chapter. Yeah. Sorry. It's the last paragraph. What was the name of the chapter? Jason. Uh, <laughs> 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 One 
171. <laughs> yeah. So the, the last. Then that way he says, um, I'm the. Hi. Hi, Bo. Okay. We'll come to that. Don't worry. Okay. Sorry. Wait. Oh, 177. Sorry. 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 Okay. Here. So. The last chapter. The last. The very last paragraph. It's a long chapter. It is. <laughs> there we go. Jason says he told me he's. What page is that? 188. It's not the last paragraph. It is. Sorry. Okay, guys. I've got it. If I can. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I color coded. Okay, I've got it. My in my favorite memory of Jason, he's standing in front of me in the cold. With frost on, on. Okay, 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 got it, got it. Folia de. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. So you want me to read that chapter? In my favorite, in my fam favorite memory of Jason, he is standing in front of me in the cold, with frost on the hairs in his nose, and the wind is stinging my cheeks. And we have just had another epic fight about God knows what, and the Minnesota snow is blinding. But also, what I need to clear my head, and I don't have a jacket on, only boots. And he says to me, "Boo boo, I am the craziest nigger you will ever meet." <laughs> Boo boo, I am the craziest nigger you will ever meet, and I am the only one who will ever love you so it hurts like this. Crazy comes at a price. Even now, this very moment as I write this, I am far away, and so much time has passed, and still I am crying with the remembering of it because Jason was my first love, and he taught me that love is not enough, and he helped me draw a line in the sand that no one else since has ever crossed. I learned from him what it looks like to belong to your own self. <laughs> now you're back home, you, you over, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you over your broken heart, you get over your broken heart, you get a job, Slowly, yep. a big job. Yep. You meet Simon White. I do. Oh, and who becomes your husband? Mm -hmm. You have babies. You buy a house and a washing machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't know how to use because I'm a madam. Um, and you finally live in this country, but you find it quite difficult in many ways. And I think two things stand out for me, and we, st we talked a bit about it earlier, that, um, that the ignorance in South Africa is quite deep. Um, and in particular, the ignorance towards towards immigrants. Uh, you could be black and African and, um, and, and uh, you know, well established in South Africa, you remain an immigrant. Um, but such doesn't happen to white immigrants who live in this country. Yep, absolutely. I think the, the thing about black and white South Africans that is common is this notion that we lived through apartheid, and so apartheid made us special. It made us a nation. And so it meant that if you are from the, the rest of the continent, you can, you can do the citizenship. Like in America, you can come from Russia and have like the craziest Russian accent, and you are American if you have, once you sit the test, you're like, I love America. You know, <laughs> you're like, you're American, you know? And everyone's like, yeah, you know, I've known him. He's American, you know? So there's it's an immigrant nation, and people embrace that idea that you can become American if you believe in America. And a lot of Africans from the rest of this continent believe in South Africa. They believed in South Africa, past tense. You know, people, want, people fought for us. They believed for us. They wanted the best for us. And then we achieved freedom in some measure because they helped us. And, they, and then they ca came. And, and, and then we didn't they really want them anymore <laughs> because not that we had used them, but we never really fully understood or accepted them as part of us. Or um, maybe we never accepted ourselves as part of the continent. That's even more real. That's exactly it. That we never saw ourselves as part of this continent. Uh, and that cuts across both black and white. So that was a very interesting thing to me because when you grow up in the rest of the continent, and you see South Africa's destiny as fundamentally tied to the destiny of the continent. Africa will not be free until South Africa is free. We said that all the time in Young Pioneers meetings <laughs> 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 as we gumboot danced, you know? So 
so that when you grow up thinking that and then suddenly you come to the place that you were wishing for, hoping for, fighting for, and then the people are like, who are you? It's very confronting and difficult and painful. And so, yeah, that was definitely something that required getting my head around when we... But I mean, the other thing that I think you sort of um, tried to get your head around was, was just being black and middle class in post-apartheid South Africa and having to do things like hire help and... I mean, you did some crazy I'm stuff. I'm very bad. I'm a very <laughs> bad madam. I'm a very bad madam because I am like, like I get the white guilt thing, right? So, yeah, she's <laughs> totally, I mean, yeah. You really, like, maybe if she wasn't black. It would yeah, <laughs> if I wasn't black, I would be that bleeding heart liberal, like, white lady, you know? It's like, here, take the keys to the car. <laughs> <laughs> Moving with my <laughs> with your own family, moving to my house with your own family. <laughs> yeah. You know, Susan is pregnant and her helper is pregnant at the same time. I just could not get my head around. But that what, what was supposed to happen? So she had maternity leave. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> the thing. Yeah, I mean, my so so my mom's mommy's thing was always like you girls are too soft and like you know you're just like your father and you're so idealistic and you have to get tough people are going to take advantage of you kind of thing and like i get that but i also like don't believe in that uh bullshit to be honest <laughs> you know like i think that classes stuff is convenient and so i did we did try i do try to live my life fairly. So if Nikki is happy about being pregnant and is pregnant because having a baby is something people want to have, then that's what it is. And if the timing is that we're both pregnant at the same time in the house, then we've just got to figure it out, you know? Um, and the worst, I st and this, I still <laughs> feel very bad about is the fact that, so the story is basically um, the woman who helped me through very difficult postpartum de depression and was like there when I didn't know that I could actually be there for my kids, she was there for my kids. So like owed her, a owe her a huge debt of gratitude and always will. And then she lies to us, you know? She, she lies in an unnecessary lie and it felt like such a huge betrayal. And, and the betrayal felt that it, it is one that I didn't recover from. And part of what was happening was my own middle class obliviousness in not seeing it coming. And part of it, what was happening is that the structural nature of relationships between the different classes in South Africa mean she ought not to trust me. She is absolutely correct not to trust me. And she is right, because when she lies, I can't forgive her. So I, did, you know, I didn't forgive her. She's, she's gone. She, we, she, we fired her because she broke this trust. And part of the reason for the trust was my own naivete. It's a bind. It's this, 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 like this bind. So I didn't want to write about the maids and madams thing in a way that <laughs> felt like it was something apart from me, like that's a white people problem. Part of what I wanted to do with this book was to say, we are deeply implicated in privilege. Yeah. And I can't call out white privilege and entitlement if I can't call out my own and talk about how difficult it is to navigate this stuff. It's yeah. very hard. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, uh, it brings me to my, maybe the last question is, maybe the second last question is around, you know, crime in South mm. Africa and you know many people say oh, well you know white people complain about crime all the time um, and then they you know they, they move because crime is so difficult and it's not solved and uh, uh, this country's going down uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yet you experience the same thing and you had to go through those similar questions yourself because you know Simon is not from here Simon and is from Australia he's like why are South Africans so 
committed to South Africa. The people are trying to kill your kid. <laughs> You're busy telling me you struggled. You love South Africa. Hey, hey. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't, you know, I don't get it. <laughs> so there is this loadedness to some things that are, if it was any other country, it would be a practical issue. Hmm. Somebody tried to kill my kid. I think I should move to a different neighborhood without any guilt or, you know what I mean? It's just like, oh, this is, a, this is a practical issue. So often, you know, my partner approaches issues in a very straightforward way because he doesn't have the baggage of loving the country, uh, apartheid, whiteness. He just, he's just like, mm, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so that's been a real lesson. You know, it's like, I, I can't do that, but he can do that. So part of the struggle in our relationship and certainly in the book is this idea that it's not that easy to, that there are some things about which we should be straightforward about South Africans, which we cannot be. And this is the ultimate question about belonging. And so even though I feel myself in some moments as this real outsider to South Africa, like I look at things from the outside, at heart when it comes to making the decisions that seem to make the most sense, I am a South African. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to go. I'm, so I'm living in Australia, hostage. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is like, when am I going home? When's the next trip home? Like, this is not a resolved question for me. I, I would be lying to this room if I was like, oh yeah, it's easy, yeah, it's fun, and great beaches. No, <laughs> I am like, when am I going home? This is a, there's something about this country. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. And uh, the last thing is, it's your disappointment in the political leadership of this country that... I don't even want to talk about them. Okay, let's not talk about them. We'll take questions. 